good evening friends <coughs> we are a couple of minutes ahead of schedule and that is on purpose so that we can wait for our friends to join and uh, more importantly we can test whether the audio etc is working quite fine so as our friends begin to peep in i think we'll be at the stroke of seven try and talk maybe for 30 odd minutes on the new education policy <clears throat> 2020 which was approved by the union council of ministers the union cabinet which met yesterday and there is of course a lot of coverage already in the newspapers today but i think uh, people would have been going through the official press notes the report itself and uh, a lot of uh, debate is expected not only tonight on television but also generally in the public domain we are going to have uh, a lot of discussion on this very important uh, initiative of government of india which really impacts each one of us today tomorrow day after so whether you are interested in the education of your grandchildren whether you are a retired person who wants to give back to the society or you are a student or a teacher i think for everyone this education policy which has come and it is claimed it is going to be a paradigm shift that is something which people are going to be looking forward to so without much ado there are two things about education it is something which is not esoteric in the sense that it is not something which is of interest only to a few sometimes you talk in terms of a defense policy of foreign policy your space policy and the initiatives elsewhere and the people would say okay you know fine you tweak the income tax rates please tell me how does it impact me in terms of my tax bill but education is something which really impacts each and every enlightened individual literate or illiterate educated or uneducated and very interestingly everyone seems to have an opinion on what education in this country ought to be like whether they can justify that opinion or not that is entirely a different thing but i think this is the hallmark of a mature democracy a mature parliamentary democracy that everyone virtually that i have spoken to in the last 24 hours have had their own views as to what an education policy ought to be like now in terms of uh, the political statements before independence after independence in fact the first declaration that we should be investing 6% of our gdp in education came as early as 1948 so the statements or the rhetoric if one may say so has been there since the dawn of independence and even before independence we had institution like the banaras hindu university which were set up before independence so therefore the overall political consensus of investing more in education has always been there but somehow our initiatives have been a little disjointed and the type of dividends that uh, we thought we as an independent country would be able to derive from education policy which of course spreads from institutions of national importance to central universities to state universities to affiliated colleges to schools and all anganwadi centers the gamut really is very wide it's very simple to say education policy but when you delve deep 
you are dealing with cutting edge research institutions and at the same time a three year old kid who's going to a village Anganwadi to have informal preschool education. So the spread is really huge. Now some people have questioned me that uh, in spite of this general political consensus that uh, we need to invest more in education, why has over the decades our performance been at best lackluster and there have been only islands of excellence and we keep on talking in terms of emulating them. Now the thing about uh, education and investment in education is that the gestation period is really huge. If you have a child at three years of age going into the Anganwadi or the pre-nursery school, it is going to be two decades by when he's going to graduate or a postgraduate, get his engineering degree or become a doctor that may take even more and then ultimately start contributing to the economy. So in a scenario of electoral politics where you're looking at the next elections, sometimes and somehow your investment in education seems to take the back seat. You would rather complete that bridge before the election and pump in money there rather than put huge sums of money into a silent sector which of course is otherwise everyone agrees the best investment that any government can make is the investment in education because those are the people, those are the kids who are going to be the future of India and going to ultimately contribute towards the building up of this great nation. And as we normally hear this statistic where two thirds of the country is under 35 years of age, all the more reason why more investment needs to take place in the education sector. So pardon me for this slightly longer introduction, but it has to be placed in a context. One cannot, you know, go to the PowerPoint presentation which the ministry has put and, you know, write a lot of the points. We will not be able to place it in a context. And if we are to really appreciate within a limited time of 30 minutes or so as to what this policy is doing, we need to understand the context. Another debate which has been taking place around education is this trade-off between quality and quantity. You know, you could have a limited number of in Indian Institutes of Technology and those Indian Institutes of Technology could cater to a limited number of students. And it was not for want of investment. People would say, where are the teachers? How do you start a good institution of excellence if there are no teachers? In other words, a kind of a chicken and egg paradox or an excuse being given. But in a country which is 135 crores, we cannot be rest content with five or six IITs. There may be 10 or 12 or a few Indian Institute of Management being added to say that these are the centers of excellence. So therefore, we need to have an impact on a demographic scale. Each and every college cannot be a St. Stephen College of a private sector or a government Mindra College in the public sector in a governmental sector in Punjab. When it came in 18 something, it was affiliated to the Calcutta University. So you see the initiative at that time of the princely states in 1870 or something, setting up a college and the nearest affiliating university was Calcutta University. Having said that, there is also a type of discussion and debate that, you know, look at the government primary school there in shambles. One NGO will come and tell you, sir, you give us half the amount that you're spending on a primary school, give us the worst school in the border areas and we will then show you what education is like and they'll show you one school, they'll show you 10 schools, and maybe they'll be able to show you 100 schools. But when you are dealing as a state, as a government, even a relatively small state like Punjab, where you have 12,000 villages, you have approximately the same number of primary schools, 
achieving excellence in one, 10 or 100 is easy. But once you want to scale up to 10,000, then the challenges come in terms of not only the administration, in terms of the budgets, more importantly, the type of teachers, whether they are available and motivated enough to take on the students. The other context which we need to understand, because sometimes the debate in this country is led by the headlines that hit the newspapers the next day when the policy was announced, they cull out something from the official paper itself and that really starts the discussion. For instance, there is a mention that the primary school, in primary school, the medium of instruction shall be the mother tongue of the child. Now, this really has taken a discussion and debate in one direction and this is the most important question which people are asking. But before we rush to answer the question, it is not as if from tomorrow the St. John School, Chandigarh is going to start uh, teaching their primary classes in Hindi or Punjabi or the Yadavindra Public School, Patiala is going to start teaching in Punjabi. What if different uh, students are declaring different mother tongues? Are you going to have, you know, two medium of instructions in Punjab where Punjabi and Hindi are approximately 50-50. What about Delhi? If people have declared Urdu as their mother tongue, are you going to have medium of instruction as Urdu? So those are the type of questions which are genuinely coming. But we need to understand that this policy is a broad policy of intent of Government of India. Would definitely apply to the Government of India institutions, the Navodaya Vidyalas, and so on, which the government of India, the central schools which they are running are affiliated to the CBSE, the Central Board of Secondary Education and so on. Also would apply to the central universities and institutions like the IITs and IIMs who are already there. But we must understand within a constitutional framework and within the federal polity of this country that education is on the concurrent list. That means both the central government and the state government have a say, not only to legislate, but also in terms of the executive issues surrounding education. In fact, when uh, the constitution was framed, at that particular time, education was a state sector, and it was only, I think, in the 42nd Amendment, which came during emergency, that education was lifted for good reasons to be in the concurrent list. So the central government is now able to take initiatives at a national level. But if there are strong and compelling reasons, a particular state government, in my humble opinion, can depart and divert from the policy by framing a suitable law, at least in terms of the government run or the government aided institutions. We must also see in the prism of the fact that the right to education is now a fundamental right. It was not a fundamental right when the constitution was adopted on 26th of January 1950. But subsequently, education was added as a fundamental right and education at the elementary level. So up to 14 years of age, class 8th, We had education being declared by way of a constitutional amendment to be a fundamental right. And at the same time, a central act came into place so that it was a right, a justiciable right of a child to seek free and compulsory education, compulsory for the parents. You could not, by virtue of the law, keep your kid away to say, no, I am going to put my child into apprenticeship, he's going to join my cobbler shop and I'm not going to send him to school. It was incumbent and mandatory for the parent. So right to education not only made education as a fundamental right, it also made education at the elementary level free and compulsory. I have had the good fortune of uh, working in the school education sector in Punjab for almost three years. 
that was from uh, 2004 to 6 and then one year in higher education I also had a stint in technical education so therefore I can say from a personal experience that I have at least at the state level seen very closely what the primary school secondary school the colleges and the universities the technical universities and also holding the additional charge sometimes of medical education so I say these things with some semblance of an experience which cumulatively would be something like four or five years so we have this right to education in the background of this policy no policy can dilute it it can only strengthen it in fact the policy is a vehicle and instrumentality of the central government to push for this right to education the other point which needs to be emphasized is that in the Indian Constitution in the fundamental rights while we're talking in terms of the fundamental right of education we must also understand that the Constitution also guarantees rights to minorities so if you go through article 29 and more particularly article 30 of the Constitution the minorities which are linguistic and religious minorities are given a fundamental right constitutionally guaranteed to be able to run their own educational institutions in the manner in which they like so a question would arise whether by way of this policy could you make it mandatory for the minority institutions that are not relying on government grants to comply with this in mandatory terms those are constitutional and legal issues which are going to come another criticism which generally we have uh, seen of previous initiatives including previous policies has been that none of these policies have really put the student at the center of the policy in fact if I were to single out the hallmark of this policy in my personal opinion and this talk is entirely in my personal capacity and nothing with to do with the official position that I may be posted in or at it is for the first time that we have a policy which really puts the student at the center now, whether that student is a three-year-old child who's now going to go into a pre first grade class in a Sarkari system or whether it is a PhD scholar or whether it's a person pursuing undergraduate and graduate studies all those are things which are putting the student in the middle of it and of course the quality of education and the concern for the teacher is there but the education policy or the education department in some states they degenerate into teacher welfare departments that is definitely not the case with this policy now if you go to this background of the policy the government set up Kasturi Ranjan Dr. Kasturi Ranjan Commission to advise it on the formulation of the new policy and the gamut was very wide right from pre-primary to the doctorate and research oriented universities and interestingly we say education is no rocket science it is common sense Dr. Kasturi Ranjan himself is a space scientist so the government thought it worth its while to put a person from a cutting edge technology sector as head of the committee and if you go through the nine members of the committee not a single one of them is an IS officer either in personal or in official or ex officio capacity so therefore these nine gentlemen of course have had and worked very closely with what was till now described as the Ministry of Human Resource Development the school education the higher education departments within that ministry consultation with the various stakeholders autonomous institutions state governments and so on so it has been a long process and after six years of deliberation and consultation the policy has been approved by the Union Council of Ministers as I stated yesterday now 
the report on which this policy is based is 400 pages. It is not in the scope of this small talk and informal talk to refer to each of those. So I will place reliance on the official press notes which have come out through the Press Information Bureau of Government of India and whatever material is available on the websites officially of the ministry to take you through the broad and the salient features of this particular policy. As I said, something which has grabbed the attention is no language shall be imposed on any student. This is a sentence occurring in the official document right after they say that the medium of instruction still primary classes and preferably even till class 8 shall be in the mother tongue. But quote unquote no language shall be imposed on any students. So any person who would say that a contentious issue like you know, imposition of Hindi or trying to get a particular language through the official channel and so on. What they have said is it should be as far as possible in the mother tongue and it has also been clarified that no language shall be imposed. Now I had already touched whether if there are different sets of mother tongues so what? What is government going to do? Those are the issues which have to be resolved and what if I as a parent or someone else is declaring his mother tongue to be English and are the government institution then bound to provide the medium of instruction in English. Now the debate whether English should be the medium of instruction, mother tongue should be the medium of instruction, that is something where people hold very, very polarized views and I don't think there is ever going to be a consensus anywhere in the world. People will say Japanese and Chinese, they you know, teach you in the mother tongue and see where they've gotten and we are trying to grapple with English and so on and so forth. Another point which you need to emphasize is that while they have said that the medium of instruction shall be in the mother tongue, the policy does not say that English shall not be taught in the primary classes. So this is something very important to underscore. The policy is not saying jettison English, teach English as English ought to be taught and English to be taught by a teacher or teachers who are trained in English. I remember for a long time in Punjab, the social study teachers used to actually be teaching English and the initiatives to recruit proper English teachers came much later. So therefore, these are the tricky points in terms of the medium of instruction at the primary level, the future of English, I've flagged the rights of the minorities and the right of education. We have to see in this background. Now, what is happening to the school education? You know, after a long, long time, we had gotten used to 10 plus 2 plus 3. I remember I passed out my class 10th in December 1976 and we were at the cusp and the transition when the senior secondary or the higher secondary or the senior Cambridge got merged and I left school in class 10th to pursue pre-university and pre-engineering in a college taking university examinations before actually going into the engineering college. Now the equation which is coming instead of 10 plus 2 plus 3 it is 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. Panj jama ten jama ten jama char kine bane ji aath te saath pandra. 10 plus 2 plus 3 bhi pandra ne. Te e panj ki ne these are three years actually have been added to education before you get into grade one. In fact that was a single lacuna which the state governments had been grappling with. We were taking in our formal schools, government schools, a child at the age of six in class one. And the private schools were having 
an LKG, a UKG, a prep, a kindergarten or whatever you may say, a play school. And for three years, the child was actually going and learning things, numbers, languages, painting, getting along with kids, peer relationships. And what did we have in the governmental sector was the Anganwadi system, which is under the Department of Social Security or the Department of Women and Child Development as distinct from the Department of Education. I've also had a chance to serve in that department, so I actually have seen the state of Anganwadis that we have. And since the departmental divisions are so sharp, an Anganwadi working in a particular school would say, well, these are my kids. Why are you taking them to a you know, KG class in a government school? Tomorrow my Anganwadi is going to be wound up. Now, a very enlightened and a long-awaited part of this policy has been really to grapple and take the bull by the horn to say that before you get into a formal class one at the age of six, we will as a state government, we will as a state government supported by Government of India under the National Education Policy 2020, have three years of education. So our Anganwadi centers are going to go in for a big change. As you know, the Anganwadi centers, preschool, non-formal education is only one of the six strands, as they say. They're also looking after expecting mothers, lactating mothers, midday meals are being given, immunization and so on is being done. But now this is going to be integrated seamlessly into the education sector. And the paper has been at pains to say that close coordination between the new Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Women and Child Development, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and of course, Ministry of Tribal Affairs and Tribal Areas have to work very closely so that this kind of a divide that one had between an Anganwadi Centre and the primary school that is bridged. And that was also the reason why private schools were able to take our kids between the age of three to six. And once a kid gets there, then the tendency of the parent is to make him continue there. Now the governmental sector is going to spread and we are going to have free and compulsory education provided from the age of three and also accompanied by free midday meals. So this is something very important which we may miss in all the noise and din, which sometimes our TV studios, uh, they tend to create, that the three years of education before the child gets into grade one, that is between the age of three to six, the child is going to be in a preschool, you call it Anganwadi or whatever, and all those have to be working in close coordination, the ministries and departments, irrespective of the departmental silos that we create. Now, what happens after class sixth onwards? There are, we've talked in terms, I remember Kuthari Commission and so on coming, vocationalization of education was a big thing and when we were taking the civil service examination, we used to be talking vocationalization is going to come, you need to develop a skill. So they have said now very clearly from class six onwards, vocational education is going to be introduced. I remember in our school, a public school, we used to have hobby classes and I did carpentry, I did cane work, I did photography, I did chess, depending on whatever I opted for. Now here you have to, from class six onwards, a vocational education. So not only the three R's of reading, writing, arithmetic, and your languages and your uh, social studies and so on, very good, but vocational education. And also exposing the child to real life type of a situation. He would be working as an intern. I mean, we have an old apprenticeship act, it's a beautiful act post World War II, but the child in this case would actually be going to a live working environment to see how things actually work and that will help him not only with toning up and honing up the skills which he learnt in a vocational class 
but also how actually things are being done when you go there. Another thing which has come very clearly, and I don't know it has not hit the headlines, is that the semester system is going to be now going through the school system. Each semester is going to be six months. So you are going to have semester examinations the next semester. And the semester system, which you generally had in engineering colleges and higher classes, is now going to be teleported, transposed, implanted, ingrained, grafted, whatever you may say, into the school education. So school education is going to have a semester system. And those of you who were wondering whether the board examination at class 10th and 12th would continue or not, or you're just going to have an internal assessment, there's going to be favoritism, there are pets of the teachers and they will score the high marks and so on. They have said very clearly that the board examination at the stage of class 10th and 12th will continue. There should not be any doubt whatsoever that board examinations are going to be there. This is not mutually exclusive to the semester system. The board examination would be there. Now, what weightage is going to be given to the board examination, to the internal assessment, to the semester exams and so on, that is entirely a different thing. But no one is saying that the board examination after 10th and 12th is going to be not there. In fact, there is a categorical and affirmative situation to say that the board examination is actually going to be there. So for all this, we need, and it is reiterated, an investment of 6% of the GDP getting into the education sector right from pre-primary to the institutes of excellence. Now this is a huge target. We've been talking about it since 1948. But in a scenario where the GDP will expand post-COVID, we will have to have the political will. I can speak on the type of fiscal space that is available in the state and the union budgets where you have committed expenditures on salaries, on pensions, on defense, on debt servicing. But ultimately, we will have to cut expenditure on unnecessary side and also put it into education. And what is sometimes missing, and the policy has emphasized, is the quality of the expenditure. I'm in the same room which a panchayat constructs for an amount X. If your PWD is constructing at 2X, the policy is going to favor the panchayat to build up the school rooms additionally that may be required. Similarly, in terms of the teacher scales and so on, that is a separate matter. If you're paying someone 10,000, someone 35,000, you can say my investment is three and a half times the private sector, but whether the corresponding quality is coming or not, that is entirely a different thing. So the policy says we have this huge milestone uh, guiding Nadan Star to be able to find resources, 6% of the GDP, that is both the central government and the state governments put together. And the quality of the expenditure also is going to be increased. So in this scenario, they have said very clearly that in spite of all our Sarv Siksha Abhyans and so on and so forth, where universal education was supposed to be there, we still have two crore out of school children for whatever reason, they may be migrant labor, brick kiln labor, living in slums, living in isolated tribal areas, hill areas. The policy is addressing very clearly that we have to get two crore children who are out of the school system, who otherwise need to be there because they are under 14 years of age in the school system, they have to be gotten in special efforts and arrangements to be made to integrate them into the class in which they ought to be. Now, these are technical terms. I'm now coming to higher education, that is after school, plus two board exam. Now, we are getting into the colleges. They say that we are going to increase the GER, the gross 
enrollment ratio to 50 percent. Now this is something first we need to understand what cross enrollment ratio is and currently it is around 26 to 27 percent. If I may say in Punjabi, jede bache college ponche, ona nu gino, ona nu pucho thode naal, pehli jamaat de vich kinne chale si. Oda answer aare hai ke ji ji sao bacha mere naal daakhal hoya si, pehli jamaat de vich, ta sirf ik bata char bache ne jede college di education wal daakhal hoye ne. Whether they ultimately get a degree or not is something else. So right now, our gross enrollment ratio as a country, Chandigarh incidentally has a very good GER. That means a lot of kids who do their plus two are generally picking up a graduate degree from none other than the Punjab University Chandigarh. But this policy aims very ambitiously that our gross enrollment ratio, which is about 26 to 27 percent, must go to 50 percent. That means for every 100 students who have enrolled in class one, at least 50 percent must pursue higher education at the college and university level. And easier said than done, you have to create three and a half crore seats in the various colleges and universities to meet this demand. It is very easy to put numbers to say 50% by 2035. 2035 appears to be very distant, but it's nearly 15 years ago. I remember when uh, we joined service in 1984 and late Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi said health for all by 2000, it looked, you know, somewhere in very distant future. 2000 came and now it's 20 years past 2000. Therefore, this 15 years in which this has to be achieved till 2035, a gross enrollment ratio of 50% will mean strengthening your secondary schools, your high schools, and making sure they are affordable and also creating capacity of three and a half crores in government colleges universities where the children can actually study and obtain their graduate degrees. Hurrying up a little, we have talked in terms of uh, now college education. What after the plus two? What after class 12th? Now they say it is a holistic multidisciplinary education. If you want to study geography, you're also interested in music, you can pick up the combination. And not a course that you cleared, not an year that you did in college, not an exam that you passed is going to go waste. What does that mean? So once after school you enroll in a college, if you do just one year, we used to have TDC, three-year degree course, you be a part one, kita us baad have done nothing. But now, if you complete one year in college, you get a certificate. At least you've done something. And if you've done two years in the college, you would get an advanced diploma that may be worth something in the market. And three years, you get a bachelor's degree. Some people are saying, well, they made the degree courses now equivalent to four years. Like in America, you're going to delay our graduation by one. You are still going to get a bachelor's degree after three years. But what you get after four years is bachelor's degree with research. Now, what is a bachelor's degree with research? Maybe it's a kind of an honors degree, but it is something more than a bachelor's degree. But the basic benchmark continues to be with three years. And other thing is the credits that you earn, they are going to be carried along with you. You've done two courses from Punjab University, Chandigarh, you relocate to Patiala and are in a college currently affiliated with Punjabi University, Patiala, and tomorrow you are in Amritsar affiliated with Guru Nanak Dev University or going to Coimbatore, those credit points are going to be teleported with you, almost like your karma points, the good and bad karmas will go along with you. 
and this is a huge huge thing when i said this for the first time the student is at the center of a policy i mean if you see migrating from one university to another it's a huge task why migrating from one u- university to another i'm mean, just see moving your child from one cbse affiliated school in chandigarh to another that itself is a huge task but now this policy is going to open up vistas you are beginning your education here you've done your two years picked up some credits you want to go to a particular university or college where better course is available you want to specialize in other subject you can go there and your karmic points your academic points which you cleared they will go along with you now what happened to amphil master of philosophy master of philosophy they say sands abolished because as i understand being a non expert amphil came when we made it compulsory for college lecturers we said master of arts is not sufficient msc is not sufficient please do an amphil it was a prelude to actually doing your phd but now it is being said that since almost it is mandatory for you to be a phd if you really want to be a lecturer and then assistant professor as they call it therefore amphil will go you will still have one and two years post graduate courses if you want to tone up your skills beyond the masters but amphil as we understand would really go so that is what is happening at your graduation level now this is where we come to the apex body and this is where the maximum discussion and debate i am told by the ministry officials has been there because i think sam petroda's knowledge commission started off saying that was with the upa government i remember attending one of the meetings when mr arjun singh was the hrd minister and the knowledge commission had stated that higher education is over regulated but under governed now i didn't really understand what they were trying to say but if you really want to open an institution of higher education which means giving graduate education a bed or a ba or an mba the type of approvals that you require are humongous for instance you want to set up a bed college of course assuming that all the benchmarks in terms of teacher the infrastructure the faculty you provide you require a no objection certificate from the state government there is a national council for teacher education which is statutory body you require their approval then the affiliating university which is ultimately going to award you the degree you have to fulfill their affiliation norms that is regarding bed similarly for llb the bar council is there for architecture degrees the council of architecture is there affiliating university could be your technical university but you also have all india council of technical education and then there is the granddad of them all the university grants commission a statutory body originally it was meant to give grants to the universities which were basically in the state sector but when private universities came they were given autonomy by the respective state laws to have their own curriculum the role of ugc went down the role of the all india council of technical education which was looking after not only diploma but degree engineering courses mbas in terms of number the importance increased so what are they doing about these number of regulatory bodies but before i go there let me put a caveat there and this is a very important caveat and that caveat is this policy has not touched two fields and for very good reason firstly it has not touched medical or the clinical education so the medical council of india and your affiliating universities are going to regulate because that is a different kettle of fish also in terms of law the llb the bar council's role the affiliating university's role that has been kept out but everything else whether it is an engineering degree whether it is an mba degree whether it is phd in rocket science everything is going to be covered by this policy now here 
in a scenario where you had multiple regulatory bodies, you have the University Grants Commission, NAC is there, National Accrediting Council and so on and so forth, and All India Council of Technical Education, National Council of Teacher Education. Now we are going to have one big granddad, so to say, and the name is, the acronym is not very comfortable, but it is HECI. So it is Higher Education Commission of India. So commission is at this level and council is at this level. So one big body which is going to take the overall role and there are going to be four vertical pillars is going to be the Higher Education Commission of India. Of course, the UGCs, the AICT and other institutions are going to mesh and merge with this. There is going to be a turf war. The people from these institutions would like to be in the apex commission. The role of the ministry in sorting out those tussles and the political leadership in sorting out those tussles would be very important. But this would be a kind of apex body and the policy says it will be faceless in sense everything would be through online whatever permissions are required and deemed approvals coming. Those of you who would want to know a little bit more in a couple of minutes I would say that this HECI, the Higher Education Commission of India would have four verticals. One would be for regulating where to start, where to have an institution and so on. And then you have standards. What type of standard you expect a BSc student, engineering student, what is the course content? Should be this subject be taught at this rigor at the master's level or the bachelor's level? So the standards. And then would be the funding, which was originally the job of the UGC. One vertical of this HECI is going to be funding. Where are you going to put the resources? Because all these centers of excellence, whether there's an IIT and so on, they require IMs. None of them are subsisting on government fees. Otherwise, the student fees. Otherwise, the fees would really shoot through the roof. So now the funding is going to be a very important part of this HECI is the commission subordinate to it and other is accrediting, which means you are certifying almost like an Indian Standard Institute that this particular college, this university is at this level. So I think we need to very closely watch where and how HECI is going to work. Four standards, four strands subsuming the role of the University Grant Commission of All India Council of Technical Education and this would really be the big granddad and I personally feel how it conducts itself, whether it is going to decentralize its functions, whether it is going to have right uh, type of a balance between too much of rigor in terms of quality or too much dilution of the quality, that remains to be seen but HECI, the Higher Education Council of India sorry, Commission of India is going to be a body which is going to play a very, very crucial role in terms of higher education and university education. So in all this, friends, what happens to our colleges? Modi College Patiala, Government College for Women Ludhiana, Government Brijendra College Faridkot, Government Mahindra College, in this whole policy, what is the policy thinking about the colleges as we understand a DAV college for women Chatiyad? Both in the private sector, both in the Sarkari sector and then of course we have what are called the aided institutions, the Hindu College Amritsar, the Lailpur Khalsa College, the Khalsa College Amritsar and so on and so forth where they are technically private but a lot of government funding is going on. Now, This policy really gives you two trajectories, two paths diverged as they say. If you are good enough, then over next 15 years till 2035, the college would become given some graded autonomy, it is going to give you its own degree. This business of colleges being affiliated with a university is going to come to an end and for very good reason. 
the universities ought to be institutions of excellence they got to be doing research teaching at that level but most of our universities are busy managing the colleges conducting their examination and who's marking the papers papers from one college are going to the other and from the other to the third and ultimately the university is basically compiling the results so now a very paradigm shift in college education is a college would either move towards graded autonomy and be giving your own degrees you would have a degree by punjab university chandigarh you would have a degree bachelor of arts with research given by government college for men chandigarh on the other hand if you do not have if you do not have that type of standing or expertise then you have to become a constituent college of the university what is a constituent college is you become a part and parcel of the university you are almost subsumed by the university so if you're good enough then you become autonomous award your own degrees if you're not good enough you will become a constituent college in fact about 10 years ago government of india had come up with very good scheme i was then secretary of uh, higher education where they said in districts where the gross enrollment ratio is poor you are going to set up colleges and those colleges you had two options one is a traditional governmental system like a government college mansa or you say it is going to be constituent college of the affiliating university which may be punjabi university patiala and punjab at that time had opted for the constituent college model for two reasons that a you don't get into the budgetary ways and means issues which government colleges may get into and other is as a part of a university you are a part of a better ecosystem so now the colleges as we understand not tomorrow but in the next 15 years are either going to be autonomous colleges awarding their own degrees or they are going to be becoming constituent colleges of the affiliating universities now we are heading towards the apex and uh, towards the end of uh, this talk they are talking in terms of meru so meru not in the taxi service m e r u is the acronym and it stands for multidisciplinary education and research universities now multidisciplinary they are not single discipline multidisciplinary education and research universities my hunch is the iits the iims in the central level the central universities as we have and of course as you will have the national institutes of technology already there the former regional engineering colleges are now nits all these will become merus and i think good universities in the state sectors will also have to become merus and what a meru is doing is not conducting examinations for undergraduate students which most of our university is doing they are going to be multidisciplinary centers of higher education cutting edge research and that is what this meru is all about and the policy says meru is at the apex type of a thing but within the universities there is going to be a continuum and what that continuum is you got a research university you got a teaching in incentive university and then you have a university which is kind of uh, you know uh, subsuming your colleges in other words the university definition has also been graded in three ways it's very important to understand where the university is is it a research university is it a teaching in intensive university or it is an autonomous you know at the lower level in the university the autonomous college which is granting degrees also indirectly a university so universities you have the multidisciplinary education and research universities then you have research incentives teaching intensive and of course the autonomous colleges so 
what we understand by university is also going to change and change depending on the focus whether you are research oriented teaching oriented or you're just a standalone old autonomous college which has become a university and by virtue of that you'll be granting your own degree there are many other areas in terms of digital education in terms of online education distance education access for women gender issues differently abled students persons with disabilities and so on how to fund research all those is a part of this beautiful document which ultimately would stand as a beacon light for all further all further progress and for it to be successful needless to say the political will both at the central and at the state government is no doubt required in terms of funding this is one area where you can't charge extraordinary fees from students why otherwise are we aiming at 6% of gdp being invested in education so lot of funding political will to sort out this new granddad commission which is coming up at the central level and more importantly i think we need to have a lot of coordination between the existing institutions everyone is going to be busy defending his turf and expanding his turf as we know when such huge reforms come there can be perceived to be winners and losers and in this little turf fight a university grant commission trying to grapple with the all india council of technical education one university wanting a particular big college to remain and a constituent college whereas this college wants to you know actually go and become an autonomous degree awarding institution those type of conflicts have to be resolved not by virtue of personal egos and authority but keeping in view the interest of the students and also keeping in view where the country is what is the trajectory of the country as such and if that is so then of course this reform chapter which has been unveiled only yesterday we could over the next decade or so see india going into an entirely different trajectory of education where not only quality but quantity both are going to be addressed so i would end with a quote from mark twain of course he said in a different sense but the sense i am going to put forth and conclude is he said i didn't allow my schooling to interfere with my education now what i leaving with my student friends and including our teachers is that all right the institutions are there the teachers are there the reforms are there the fees are very reasonable but you have to have will dedication to pursue education education is like tapasya you literally have to do a kind of a penance almost and that is why in ancient india we had you know the young princes going to gurukuls in the forest and living like virtually a recluse a b while you suck the maximum out of the formal education system also there are other ways you can educate yourself internet is such a beautiful source of education your optional internships so on so forth so please don't allow your schooling to interfere with your education education is a lifelong process literacy can come but education has to continue for a lifetime and you have to constantly sharpen the edge so that ultimately not only you enrich yourself as an individual but are also able to disseminate the knowledge as they say no one is a good teacher unless he produces students who are better than him so it was a longish talk i had anticipated it should be about 30 35 40 minutes almost 1 hour if there are any questions please do leave in the comment section i will try my level best we are still going through the the print 400 pages of dr kasturi ranjan committee report of course they're going to be 
statutory notifications coming up, there are going to be further regulations framed under the various enactments and so on. So it's an ongoing process. This is just the first shot fired and the launch of a rocket which may take some time to land at its desired objective. Thank you friends, take care and have a great evening ahead.